Um, we were we had some questions last time about Bridgman's experiments. Uh, these experiments to pertain to metals. So this notion here that yielding is insensitive to pressure uh, for all practically uh, accessible empirical pressures that, that one can generate in the lab. But that, is a, that statement pertains to metals. So for example, in soil mechanics, soils certainly are, are easily deformed plastically in the sense that you can easily deform a soil or snow or something like that permanently. Um, those are quite pressure sensitive. And so this statement here really applies to metals. And so if we relax this restriction, what it, what it led us to in the case of metals is the conclusion that the yield function depends on this S, which is again, the second Euler Kirchhoff stress relative to the intermediate state, that it depends on that S via its deviatoric part, right? That conclusion would not follow in the case of soils or snow, for example. Um, so, barely, so, so we're, we're really narrowing the discussion here down to the empirical behavior of metals. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify that point from last time. <clears throat> okay, um, let's uh, spend some time, and I'll spend you know a fair bit of time talking about isotropic materials. Um, this encompasses virtually the entire uh, literature on the classical aspects of plasticity theory. Uh, it's only in more recent years that people have seriously studied anisotropic or crystalline plasticity. Um, and luckily, it's, I mean, it's not simply an academic of academic interest. It also is applicable to the large majority of engineering applications precisely because engineering metals are typically polycrystalline and those, as I mentioned before, those crystalline grains are randomly oriented typically so that on a mesoscopic say, scale, you know, a little bit larger than microscopic, you would perceive the material as being effectively isotropic. So from the continuum point of view, it's uh, isotropy is quite relevant for uh, engineering metals. So let, let's have a look at that special case of the theory. And this will also lead us to make contact with uh, the vast majority of the literature on plasticity starting from its early days up to, up to the present. Okay, so let's re, re, uh, recap where we are. Um, our yield function depends, well, oh, sorry, it depends on S. It satisfies a material symmetry restriction that we discussed last time. Your S bar is the rotated S with a rotation. Now as a member of the symmetry group, but for isotropy, that symmetry group is any ortho is the full orthogonal group. That is, any orthogonal tensor is allowed in the statement of material symmetry. Okay, that's the case of isotropy. By the way, I sent around yesterday a, a, a note on on uh, how to represent scalar valued functions in the case of isotropy. So I'll invoke that today. So for isotropy, the R in the in the symmetry group can be any rotation whatsoever. And because R occur, occurs quadratically in this expression, in fact, it can be any orthogonal tensor because to if you have the set of orthogonal tensors consists of the set of all rotations and you add to that minus the identity. And so they combine to give you any orthogonal tensor. And we saw from last time now that um, the derivative of f with respect to this rotated s is just the rotated derivative of f with respect to s. That was for any element of the symmetry group and therefore now in this case, for isotropy, that's true for all orthogonal r. Um, <clears throat> what led us to this conclusion, remember, was that uh, the energy was invariant under elements of the uh, symmetry group by definition. 
this led us to conclude that the energy depends on the strain and then the, the symmetry, not on the strain, but rather that the strain energy expressed as a function of strain satisfies a certain symmetry condition. U at E equals U at R transpose ER. That led us to a, a, a conclusion about how the yield function should behave under material symmetry transformations. So we started with this material symmetry condition here on W. Remember that H is FK, deformation gradient, inverse plastic deformation gradient. So replace FK by FKR, and you have this. And if you group K, if you put the parenthesis around KR, you can see that that's equivalent to the restriction that <clears throat> this constitutive function, and hence all constitutive functions in the theory, are invariant under the replacement k by kr, where r is any elements of the symmetry group, and therefore in the case of isotropy, any rotation r. Okay. So the constitutive equations, to the extent, if, if they involve k as they do in this formalism, then you can replace k by k bar, which is kr, without affecting the value of the constitutive function. Okay, and here f can remain fixed in this discussion. So when we when we make this replacement, we're not changing f. We're not changing the deformation of the material itself. <clears throat> okay, replacing k by kr is equivalent to replacing g by the inverse, which is R transpose K inverse, which is R transpose G. So this statement is equivalent to this one. The constitutive functions are invariant because of material symmetry under the replacement of G with G bar, which is R transpose G. R is any rotation whatsoever now in the case of isotropy. Okay, so we had a flow rule, a structure for the flow rule based on G, G dot G inverse and so on is lambda the FDS, right? Let's have a look at the flow rule for G bar. So we wanna compute G bar dot G bar inverse and see what we get. Well, here's G bar all dot, here's G bar all inverse. Just do what's, what's indicated here, expand out the derivative, then multiply by G inverse times R transpose inverse, which is R, and you get this. But now you also get this if you allow R to be time dependent. And nothing in nothing that we have said now so far forbids that, right? Because this material symmetry restriction pertains to any rotation R whatsoever. <clears throat> There's no reason why we should you know, exclude time dependent R's in this in this discussion. So let's allow for that possibility that R can depend on time. Then we get R dot transpose R after you clear out the G and G inverses here from this discussion. Okay, in the floor rule we had last time, G dot G inverses this this Lagrange multiplier object, non-negative, times dfds plus the plastic spin, skewed tensor. Just substitute that right in here, and we get this. Our transpose dfds r with the scalar out in front. Then we get um, our transpose omega r from this term, R transpose omega R, and I have R dot transpose R, and I'll write that as R transpose R, which is the identity, times R dot transpose R. So I can factor out an R transpose in front and an R in the back. This term here is just the FDS bar from what we've just said previously, and then we have this. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so what's interesting now is here, R, remember, is allowed to be any rotation whatsoever. But we can, we're allowed to choose an R in particular, 
which is such as to annihilate this parenthesis. So pick any skew omega you want. I mean, the only restriction on this plastic spin is that it, so far is that it is skew, it's a skew tensor. I'm claiming that we can always find a rotation function of time that effectively <clears throat> gets rid of this second parenthesis here to nullify that term. Let's have, let's, let's demonstrate that. So let's look at this initial value problem. Say some tensor B whose time derivative is omega B, the same omega, skew omega, and which has an initial value at say time zero, call it B sub zero, which is a rotation. So let's just initialize this B to be a rotation at time zero. Uh, this calculation may remind you of something we did at the beginning of the course when we were talking about um, invariance of the strain energy under rotations as a consequence of symmetry of the Cauchy stress. <clears throat> so it's the same calculation. So if it looks familiar, then it, it, there's a reason for that. Let's define Z to be B, B transpose. Then we can get a, a differential equation that Z satisfies. If you compute it, the dot of this, you get B dot put in omega B, B transpose, gives you a Z back again. And then do the same, you have B, B dot transpose that gives you the second term. And the, the B dot transpose brings in an omega transpose, which is minus omega. And the initial condition for Z is B zero, B zero transpose, but B zero is, is a rotation. So that initial condition is the identity. Okay, and if you recall from our earlier discussion some time ago, this has a unique solution, namely Z of T is the identity for all time. So if that's the case, then this equation in, implies that B is orthogonal. Let's have a look at the determinant of it. Say so the, the time derivative of the determinant of B, we know that that's the inner product of the cofactor of B with B dot. The cofactor, see, B is orthogonal, so it's invertible. So the cofactor then can be written as its determinant, JB times its inverse, the inverse transpose of B inner product B dot. If you remember the trace, tra definition of trace, uh, as it applies to the inner product, that's just trace of B dot B inverse. And this is B dot inner product B inverse transpose, and then that's the same as this trace. B dot B inverse, however, from the differential equation, first of all, B is invertible because it's orthogonal. So it makes sense to take the inverse. B dot B inverse is omega. So you get the trace of omega, which is identically zero because omega is skew. So it's matrix in any orthonormal basis has zeros in the diagonal. So it's trace is zero. So that means the dot of JB is zero. So at any time, the, the determinant of B is equal to its initial value, which is one because we stipulated that the initial condition is a rotation. So B is a, B is a rotation for all time. Okay, so we go back to this equation one here. We're allowed to pick any R, any rotation R because the material is isotropic by assumption, any rotation R whatsoever. So to get a necessary condition for equation one to be true, I could pick a particular rotation. I could pick B of T, which I've, as we've now established that's a rotation. So it's an admissible choice for R. Let's compute the R, R dot transpose, which appears in this second term of the parenthesis. R, R dot transpose then is B, B dot transpose. Uh, B dot is omega B. So the transpose of that is B transpose omega transpose. Omega transpose is minus omega because omega is skew and B is rotation. So B, B transpose is the identity. So you get for, you get the nest, you get for this choice of B of T, sorry, of R rather, you get that R, R dot transpose is minus omega and that 
that means this parenthesis is zero. So what we've done is to show that because this statement is true for any rotation R whatsoever, it must therefore be true for this choice of rotation, which eliminates that parenthetical term, which means that the flow rule for G bar is just this. You could define lambda bar to be lambda, and it's the same flow rule. So that, what that means is that in the case of isotropy, we can exploit the symmetry group. We can exploit the degree of freedom associated with material symmetry to effectively suppress the plastic spin in the flow rule. So we can use this flow rule here without any loss of generality, right? Because all of these G bars are mechanically indistinguishable from G, right? Because that's what material symmetry means. By the way, this procedure we have just followed is not possible for crystalline materials and isotropic materials. And we'll discuss later on, excuse me, we'll discuss the reason why later in the course, we'll come back to the general theory and discuss crystal plasticity. So what this, the simplification we've just made here does not affect the deformation F as we've seen before. What we've done is to replace K by KR while leaving F fixed. So, and if you integrate F with respect to position, you just get the deformation. So that will not be affected either. The material symmetry doesn't affect the energy. It leaves the Cauchy stress in the material unaffected. So any variable that you could actually measure in an experiment is thus unaffected by the simplification in the case of isotropy. So that's a major simplification. It means we don't have to go through the agony of trying to find constitutive equations for the plastic spin. And that, that's a, a huge simplification. And in fact, in the classical subject, classical literature for isotropic materials, you never see any reference to plastic spin. Although the classical literature is a complete mystery as to why you can suppress plastic spin. Um, and that's really because they don't discuss material symmetry in the kind of rigorous way that we're doing here. Uh, so the so what you do to handle this computationally, you put the G on the other side here, and you simply integrate this forward in time using a, a say numerical time integration method. This is a first order in time equation. You can forward integrate, but you also you have to always be sure that the state of stress when you do this remains on the yield surface. You don't violate this restriction. So you integrate this not only with this inequality, but you, you have to determine this from other some other procedure, but you also have to maintain this constraint. And so that's actually, although it looks like a simple problem to deal with, it's actually not trivial computationally. <clears throat> we'll come back to that discussion later. Okay, so let's, so, so that's a, a general framework then for isotropic plastic evolution for isotropic materials. Let's specialize our discussion to the case of small elastic strain, which is empirical from the empirical point of view, that's the relevant regime of response. Uh, if we remember what we did uh, in, to exploit the simplification afforded by small elastic strain, we, we estimated the strain energy function to quadratic order the reason we went out to quadratic order and not linear order is because we assume that the intermediate state was stress-free. We had a way of justifying that assumption before. So the stress associated with zero elastic strain, zero elastic strain means the current configuration locally coincides with the intermediate apart from a possible rotation. We assume that, that the stress at that state was zero so the leading order term in the strain energy would be purely quadratic, right? Plus a neg negligible nonlinear or higher order terms, small o, epsilon, e squared. And here was our fourth order tensor of moduli. Now in, the, in this handout I distributed, I hope you had a chance to glance at it. We require u at e to be u at 
R transpose ER for any rotation R. In other words, U is what we call an isotropic function of E. In the handout, I'm, I indicated that any such function depends on its argument, the tensor argument, through three invariants, I1, I2, and I3. So I'm, I'm hoping you had a look at that handout in the meantime. This is, that handout, by the way, is, is standard material in any introductory course in continuum mechanics. So I hope it's review. Uh, if not, then the handout is, uh, brings you up to date. So the, for an isotropic function, the scalar function has to depend on its symmetric tensor argument through its trace, the trace of E, that's I1. The second invariant involves uh, the square of the trace and the trace of the square. That part, the square of the trace, we can lump together with this term. And here, the trace of the square, we can separate out into this term. And there's a third invariant, I3, which is the determinant. But that's actually a cubic function of, the, of E itself. The determinant, if you expand it out as a matrix, you'll see that it involves only cubic terms in the components of E. So that, that gets collected in this part that we're neglecting here, and therefore we would not retain it in this leading order quadratic approximation to the strain energy. So here's the most general strain energy function for isotropy, where the E is the elastic strain. Lambda and mu are called the lame moduli, right? You may have heard of those, I assume. And I'll keep the half in front here. And the two here is just a convention. And if you've had any course in linear elasticity or if you have access to any book on linear elasticity, you will uh, recall that the strain energy is then positive definite in the case of isotropy, if and only if mu is positive. Mu has the physical interpretation of the shear modulus. And something, another combination called kappa, which you call the bulk modulus, is also positive. Kappa is defined in terms of the Lamme moduli right here. So is this is this familiar to everyone? This notion of positive shear and bulk moduli? We certainly do it in ME282, and I think some of you have had that. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm not losing anybody then. Okay, so that's the strain energy function for isotropy, isot elastically isotropic material. We take it, the derivative of it to get the stress that would just give us, the derivative of this would give us C time operating on E, or you can directly compute the derivative from the second line, maybe a bit easier, and you get lambda trace E identity plus two mu times E. So that's our C operating on E. You could use this to figure out what C is by itself, but there's really no point to doing that. Uh, this is all we need this expression for the stress. Okay. Well, this C, remember, is invertible because of the positive definiteness. C is a positive definite six by six matrix. So you can invert it. The inverse is the fourth order tensor of um, compliances, compliant, the, the so-called compliances. And that operates on S to give you E. Now this, this then stipulates that E is a linear function of S. We could plug that back, that linear function back into the strain energy. Right? Everywhere you see an E here, you put L operating on S and you get a purely quadratic function of S. So we could write the strain energy as a function of S if we want, no problem. And that's quadratic, at leading order in, in elastic strain, that's a quadratic function of S. So we, our, our small st elastic strain hypothesis has led us to approximate the strain energy ultimately, at, either as a quadratic function of E or as a quadratic function of S interchangeably. Okay, so that's the nature of the approximation that we've made. Well, we have another function of S, the yield function, and to be consistent with this approximation, 
we should approximate it also by a quadratic function. Otherwise, we're we're being inconsistent in our approximations, right? If we're going to approximate this function by qu quadratically, then we should do the same for the yield function. Well, so that just stands to reason. <clears throat> okay, um, for metals, thanks to Bridgman, we've concluded that the yield function should depend on S through its deviatoric part. The deviatoric part here is, is defined this way. This is a linear function of S, right? The deviatoric, that if you think of dev as an operator, it's a linear operation. It's a linear operator. So. And um, Professor, can I ask you something? Yeah. Um, why is it consistent to have FS as a quadratic order? Because U depicts energy. However, F does not depict energy, it depicts yielding. Therefore, yeah, I'm not certain why is that the case. Well, I mean, yeah, but the, the consistency lies in the fact that they're both constitutive functions. So yeah. if we're go, we're go, we should make, if we're going to approximate one constitutive function, it's, it's, it seems reasonable to me that we should approximate all constitutive functions to consistent order, right? In other words, it would make, it would make little sense to approximate one constitutive function and not and not approximate another constitutive function, even though one is elastic and the other one is plastic. But, but that's that's the, the what they have in common is they're both constitutive functions. So yeah, whether we call it elastic or not, in fact, f depends on the you could write f as a function of elastic strain. So it's not really yeah, it, it's really still an elastic function, I right? See. It's I, a function I that see. pertains to elasticity because okay. the argument. Is, in, is is you can replace s by the elastic strain and it becomes a function of the elastic strain. So, just yeah. like the strain energy, it's a function of the elastic strain. So, if we do if we make a quadrat a leading order approximation, say quadratic order approximation to one elastic constitutive function, then we should do so for any other elastic constitutive function. If you see what I mean, right? Yeah, I see. So yeah. that, that's that's the that's the reasoning here. Yeah, um, it makes sense. Okay, so that's a good question. I hope. Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of you know, it's tempting to think of these being entirely separate from each other, right? Strain energy or yield function. Why should they be having to do with each other? The reason is they really both pertain to the elastic response of the material, right? Yeah. Okay. And in fact, in some theories of plasticity, people take the yield function to be equal to the strain energy function itself expressed as a function of the stress. And that's pretty close to what we'll be doing here. We'll see that in a moment. Okay, so <coughs> dev S here is a linear function of S. We want F of S valid to quadratic order in S. So we should approximate F tilde by a quadratic function of deviatoric S. Right? Because S and dev S are of the same order. They're both linear in S, right? So for consistency, we should expand F tilde of S. Sorry, this should be, insert here, I, I missed it, dev S. F tilde is a function of dev S. Sorry for that. We should approximate that F tilde of dev S to quadratic order. Well, for isotropy, I mean, dev S is a symmetric tensor. For isotropy, the, that function then has to depend on the first invariant I1, which is the tr its trace, the second invariant I2, which involves the trace of the square. Sorry, the, 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 the square of the trace and the trace of the square of dev S. And then the third invariant I3 is cubic, of cubic order. So we would neglect it if we're only interested in the quadratic order approximation. So this is the most general. So these are constants. This is the most general isotropic function you can have of dev S valid to quadratic order in dev S and therefore to quadratic order in S itself. 
because everything here, a dev s is a linear function of s, right? So, okay, well, this simplifies a lot because the trace of anything deviatoric is identically zero. But that's how we define the deviatoric part. So the second term and the third term both drop out. Whereas the trace of dev s all, the, the square of dev s, that's just the squared norm of dev s itself. So what I could do is I, the, the C3, I take, take it to be whatever constant you like, non-zero constant, divide, so we want, the, the yield criterion is F tilde equals zero, right? Divide that equation through by C3, uh, and, and then multiply through by a half, and then I get this. So I, I just rearranged the constants here. I, I keep the C naught, and I'm, I want to make this a negative constant to be consistent with my original assumption that zero, S equals zero, and also deb S equals zero, therefore, lies inside the elastic range. So if you put S equals zero, you get here minus K squared, which is a negative number. So that would satisfy this restriction that we imposed in the first place. So this is then the most general quadratic yield function that depends on deviatoric S and which satisfies our other hypotheses. And this is an extremely famous yield function. It's called the von, Mies, the von Mises yield condition expressed in terms of S. Although classically in the days when von Mises was working and before and since, this would be expressed in terms of deviatoric Cauchy stress. We'll see in a moment how we can recover that. So our assumptions, small elastic strain, approximate the elastic constitutive. We only have two constitutive functions here. They both depend on the elastic strain or alternately on S. Uh, the elastic strain is small. We approximate to quadratic order in both cases and we automatically get von Mises yield function. Although he did not derive it in this way, but we have systematically derived it. Number one from material symmetry and number two from the small elastic strain empirical observation that the elastic strain is small. And then we retain leading order terms in the elastic strain. So this is kind of nice because we didn't simply write down von Mises yield cr criterion, which von Mises did. We derived it systematically from some basic understandable hypotheses, okay? Okay, by the way, being quadratic in the stress it's automatically differentiable with respect to the stress. So we'll, find, we'll compute the derivative dfds in a moment, but that gives you a smooth yield surface automatically under these assumptions. So we'll, we'll talk about how to understand Tresca's yield criterion, which is non-smooth in this context in a moment. So this is a, the most famous yield function in the whole subject, von Mises yield con condition and the most widely used by far, and for good reason. Okay, let's give an interpretation now of this constant K. <clears throat> I just, I put the square here to ensure that it's a negative constant, just to satisfy this restriction here. Right, at the moment it has no other meaning. Okay, well, it, it appears in a constitutive function, so we had better understand its physical meaning. Now this purports to be valid for any state of stress, right? Of course, dev S has to be non-zero in order to, for this F tilde to be zero in order, in, order, in order for yield to occur. Let's look at uh, the simple state of stress, a pure shear state of this form, where tensor S is a scalar S, let's say, times this, where A and B are ortho orthogonal unit vectors. You could take them to be E1 and E2, for example. Then you would just have a non-zero shear stress S12 or an S21, okay? Now the trace of this then, because of A, the assumption, because we stipulated A dot B is zero, the trace of this is, a, is zero. And so this is automatically deviatoric. So this is also the deviatoric part of S. 
let's take let's find the squared norm of it, which we need in the von Mises yield function. That's that that's interpopulates with itself, which is the trace of the square of Deb S. If you square this, you will get this, I'm claiming. You can verify that in one or two lines. Take the trace of that, you get a dot a, which is one, plus b dot b, which is one, so you get two, s squared. So for this state of stress, the yield function boils down to the scalar s squared, it's because there's a half in front of this in the yield function, minus k squared equals zero. And that's why I put the half in front, so precisely so that in this particular state of stress, that the half would cancel the two. But if you if you you could put in any other number you want in front of here, and the the result of putting f equals zero would simply be to adjust this constant k right accordingly. So this really we didn't lose any generality in doing this. So the, in this state of stress, the yield criterion and the f equals zero becomes s squared minus k squared equals zero. In other words, absolute s equals k. And since s now is a pure shear stress on this axis a and b, we now have an interpretation of k as the yield stress in shear for a shear state of stress. Now, in general, if you have the phenomenon of strain hardening after initial yield, then k can evolve with the state of the material. Here we're treating it as a constant at the moment, but we'll revisit that later. If, if K is a constant, then it becomes just a, a, a material property, like the moduli, for example. That, that situation we call perfect plasticity or ideal plasticity, which is a very useful uh, idealization we'll talk about. Okay, so <clears throat> let's have a look at the, uh, the yield condition in a sort of geometric picture. Let's take any tensor at all A. You can split it up into a deviatoric part and a part left over, which we call the spherical part. One third trace A times the identity. That's called the spherical part. And it's, it's kind of an odd name. Spherical means, it's supposed to remind us of a spherical state of stress, which is a pure pressure which has this form, something proportional to the identity, okay? And that's a nice decomposition because the set of all spherical tensors is in fact a vector space. That is to say, any linear combination of spherical tensors is again spherical. So spherical part of A plus B would involve the trace of A plus B, which is the trace of A plus the trace of B. So you get any linear combination of spherical tensors is spherical. And the zero tensor is also spherical because the trace of the zero tensor is the number zero times the identity. So it has this form. The spherical tensor can be written in this form. This is part of the zero tensor. So the, the set of spherical tensors is a linear space or a vector space. So is the set of deviatoric tensors. Any linear combination of deviatoric tensors, including the zero tensor, is, is deviatoric. And the reason this is a nice decomposition is because this space of deviatoric tensors is orthogonal to this space of spherical tensors. If you take the inner product, that'll give you I inner product deviatoric A here. I inner product anything is the trace of that thing and the trace of dev is identically zero. So these, this is an orthogonal decomposition just like splitting any tensor into the sum of symmetric and skewed parts, that's another orthogonal decomposition. So you can think of the space of spherical tensors, the tensors proportional to the identity, as being somehow perpendicular to the space of deviatoric tensors. The space of spherical tensors is essentially one dimensional because any spherical tensor is some scalar times the identity so that vector space of spherical tensor is, a, is spanned by one basis element, namely the identity tensor. So it's a one dimensional space because it's spanned by one element. If you have a, a, a symmetric tensor, that's of course a six dimensional vector space. So the part left over, the space of deviatoric symmetric tensors 
has to be five dimensional because this is one dimensional. We have to add up to six dimensions. So that gives us a nice way of understanding von Mises yield condition geometrically. So let's make a cross section of this elastic range, f of s equals zero. Uh, let's, let's divide up s space into a deviatoric five dimensional space and the perpendicular part, the one dimensional space is spherical tensors. And let's suppose that one dimensional space somehow is perpendicular to the page here. So this is obviously, you know, we're, we're doing our best to grapple with notions of five and six dimensions. So this is just sort of an, anal an analog picture. So we'll say that the, the, the plane of the page is the five dimensional cross section of the six dimensional stress space. And the, the axis here coming out of the page is the one dimensional space of spherical tensors, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so the cross section is a five dimensional space of deviatoric tensors. The yield function involves, von Mises function involves the norm of dev s, which you can think of as the distance from the origin where s is zero right here. And you, that distance then is the norm of this vector dev s. According to the yield criterion, that's this, this number square root of two times k. So the yield condition says that the distance from the origin in S space in this cross section, this space of deviatoric tensors has a constant radius. So that's a cylinder, right? It's a cylinder in the six dimensional space because we've, this is the cross section uh, we've, we've, we've cut the space in the, in the plane orthogonal to I, the spherical tensors. So that's effectively the F less than zero, the elastic range is the interior of the cylinder. So the actual yield function in terms of S is an infinite cylinder because the direction perpendicular to the page can extend infinitely below the page and above it. But nevertheless, the interior of it is a convex set, as we indicated before. Any two points inside this elastic range can be connected by a straight line without leaving the elastic range. <clears throat> so this gives you a kind of way to understand von Mises' yield function geometrically in terms of uh, geometry. So as we said before, because now we've approximated f the quadratic order, any quadratic function is automatically differentiable, of course. So the tangent plane to the yield surface is conti a continuous function of s, the point on the yield surface, right? Because df ds is a continuous function, right? It's, it's, it's differentiable, so df ds is continuous. The tangent plane is the set of points normal to dfds on the yield surface. So the tangent plane varies smoothly and continuously as you go around the yield surface. So the yield surface is smooth. So at this point, somebody will object and perhaps should that, well, what about Tresca's yield function? Everybody's heard of Tresca's yield function. Um, let's recap what we've done. For isotropy, we derived von Mises' yield function. We didn't assume it. We derived it as the most general quadratic yield function. Why quadratic? To be consistent with our approximation we made on the strain energy function. That's why. Tresca's yield function does not emerge from this procedure. That has a, Tresca's yield function has corners on the yield surfaces, does not have a, the yield surface is not smooth. It does not have a smooth a continuously turning tangent plane. Tresca's yield function is valid for isotropy. It satisfies the material symmetry restriction, but it's not quadratic. We've just proved that every quadratic isotropic yield function is von Mises' yield function. So you might say at this stage, well, gee, what kind of course is this if we're not going to talk about Tresca's yield function? 
Well, let's uh, let's have a look at what Hill said in his, his book, 19, dated 1950, which, by the way, is probably the most the single most influential book in plasticity theory ever written, including up to the present time. It's a little bit outdated, but it's still uh, a, a very authoritative reference. 1950, that's even older than I am, it, this predates the so-called modern theory of plasticity. So, but, but everything that was known up to 1950 is in that book, including all the experimental evidence for metals. And on page 21, he has an interesting quote. For most metals, von Mises' yield function fits the data more closely than Tresca's does. So from the empirical point of view, von Mises' function is superior to Tresca, even though it seems to be more restrictive in the sense that it's a quadratic approximation, whereas Tresca's is, is of higher order than quadratic. <clears throat> and Hill's comment was based on the work of G.I. Taylor and Associates, G.I. Taylor, by the way, is the thesis advisor of Hill. So these are like the, the primary authorities of, on plasticity in the 20th century. Hill from the theoretical point of view and Taylor from the experimental and also theoretical point of view. And his work was you know, really ancient, 1931, about 20 years before Hill's book was published. This very famous paper, which you should see if you can look up in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, the full citation is here. And he assessed Hill's yield condition experimentally against alternative yield criteria, including Tresca. And his, his uh, work was the basis of this comment by, by Hill somewhat later. So from the empirical point of view, we're in good shape by using uh, von Mises' criterion for in the case of isotropy. Okay, and that will be my attempt at justifying our restriction to the von Mises yield function for the case of isotropy. So I, I defer to these higher authorities here for that justification. What's, what's interesting, at least from my point of view, is it, it's, it's, the, it, it's the unique yield criterion that's consistent with our hypotheses, small elastic strain, approximating constitutive functions that depend on elastic strain to leading order in elastic strain, right? The consistent, it emerges as a, as a consistent small elastic strain approximation without any ambiguity at all. Nothing wrong with Tresca's criterion, it's just that, well, except, except that it's inferior to von Mises from the experimental point of view, and it's far more difficult to deal with analytically actually because of the derivative DFDS is ambiguous at these corners, right? It's, it's not defined at these corners on the yield surface. So it's far more difficult to deal with when you're talking about flow rules. Okay, so speaking of, we, to, to specify the flow, will, flow rule, we need DFDS, the derivative of the yield function with respect to S. And to, to find that, uh, I'd like to emphasize the use of the chain rule because it's a foolproof way of computing these derivatives. And if, imagine having to deal with the nonsense of computing the derivative of f with respect to the matrix of S components. That's a tedious and arduous and error-prone task. Much easier is to use, is to use the chain rule, for example, F dot, say the dot is a time derivative or the derivative with respect to any parameter, let's say time. F dot is DFDS inner product S dot, just the chain rule. F on the other hand is F tilde, is a function of deviatoric S. So we take the dot of that. For von Mises, F tilde is the squared norm of dev S minus K dot. And if K, we're treating K as a constant here for the time being, then k dot would be zero, and the squared norm of dev s is just inner product of dev s with itself. Take the dot of the whole thing. And now it's just a, a routine robotic exercise to figure out what we need. So just expand the derivative using the product rule. We get 
two times this one with, the, with the one half in front, we just get dev s times the dot of dev s. <clears throat> if you go back to our definition of dev s and take its dot, take its derivative with respect to time, you'll just get the dev of s dot. In other words, the dot and the dev can be interchanged. They commute as operations, okay? So you get the inner product of dev s with dev s dot. So let's write down dev s dot in terms of s dot, s dot minus the third trace times the identity. Dev s inner product, the identity is zero. That's by definition of dev s. It's dev s is orthogonal to the spherical tensors. So this inner product only picks up, you can replace dev s dot if you want by s dot without losing any information. So you compare the left-hand side here to this result, which purports to be true for all symmetric S dot. FS is already symmetric, dev S is symmetric. So we immediately conclude that because this is valid for all symmetric S dot, that the FDS must be dev S itself. Now that, that sounds, that's a simple calculation, but I guarantee you if you tried to do it the hard way by writing the FDSIJ, for example, the, the, the derivative with respect to the components of S, you'll run into all sorts of complication when you write, when you, when you try to figure out, you know, how, how um, when you write S in terms of its devious work part and trace and so on, it gets complicated. This is far simpler. So, put that on the right-hand side of our flow rule, we get g dot g inverse is lambda dev s. So this would be the flow rule that goes with our isotropic yield function, or in other words, our von Mises yield criterion. And this is symmetric. In other words, there's no plastic spin in the theory. Lambda is non-negative. We still don't know what it is. We just know it's non-negative. Like any Lagrange multiplier, we'd have to find it from other equations and initial and boundary conditions in the theory. Um, let's pause here to see if, to make sure, to, to do a reality check to make sure everything is consistent with what we've stipulated so far. For example, we better get a non-negative dissipation from this flow rule. Let's compute the dissipation when we use the Eschelby tensor epsilon prime based on the intermediate state, remember the formula Debt k dissipation is equal to epsilon prime inner product k inverse k dot. For small elastic strain, epsilon prime, the leading order approximation to it was minus this S tensor. Second Peeler Kirchhoff relative to the intermediate state. Okay, that's the leading order approximation. All the, the terms neglected here are of higher order in the elastic strain, quadratic order and higher. On the other hand, minus k inverse k dot is the same as plus g dot g inverse. Just differentiate g times k equal to the identity to prove that. Put in g dot g inverse from the flow rule, we get lambda s inner product dev s. That's the same as dev s inner product dev s because the inner product of dev s only picks up the dev of s over here. So you get the squared norm of dev s times the lambda. According to von Mises yield condition, when you have yield, in other words, the possibility that g dot is not zero, for that you have to have yield, which says that dev s squared is twice k squared if you look back at von Mises function. So you get two lambda k squared, and because lambda is non negative, that indeed, and, and k, is, k squared, of course, is a positive number, that's non negative. jk is positive, so you indeed get a positive dissipation, so everything is consistent. And in fact, you get strict dissipation here, if and only if lambda is strictly positive, but lambda strictly positive means g dot is not zero. So you get a positive dissipation if and only if there's plastic flow, which is exactly in accordance with the assumption we made on page 92, remember that not only, so, so g dot zero implies no dissipation, but we assume the converse also. No dissipation implies g dot zero. Uh, 
equivalent to that statement is the statement D positive if and only if G dot non-zero. So that's all consistent. Something else to notice from the flow rule, if you take its trace, so you have G dot G inverse is lambda deb S, take the trace of that, you get zero because of course, deb S has no trace. This trace is just the inner product G dot with the inverse transpose of G. And we can use that to compute the dot of the determinant of G, cofactor G inner product G dot, cofactor is JG G inverse transpose, Remember, G was invertible by our earlier assumption. Right? And this inner product now is zero. So the determinant of G doesn't change in time. That's what we mean by plastic incompressibility. Okay. So according to uh, von Meissi's condition, which is again, the leading order approximation, consistent with the empirical small strain, small elastic strain observation. There's no change in volume induced purely by plasticity. You can have JH evolving in time, the elastic part, but the plastic part does not contribute to the volume change in the course of the deformation. Okay. And that's basically the, in a nutshell, the theory for elastic plastic isotropic materials. Okay. Um, the classical theory pertains to the following situation. Okay, in, in, many, in many applications of plasticity, especially industrial applications, the, these entail metal forming processes where you're extruding metal, let's say, you have very large strains um, and all the while, the elastic strain is infinitesimal by comparison to the overall strain in these applications. So in, in, in a large range of industrial applications involve extremely large strains because you're, you're shaping parts into you know, drastically different shapes in an, in an industrial process. This, as I say, involves extrusion, forging, and so on. You're inducing very large strains. The elastic strain is tiny, so most of the strain is, comes from plastic deformation. Almost all of it is due to plastic deformation. So this suggests a, a, an idealization that we might introduce into the theory to cover these kinds of applications. And that is the case, the elastic strain is so small that we might as well neglect it. In other words, the right Cauchy, the right Cauchy green deformation based on the elastic part of the deformation is essentially the identity. Not exactly so, but close enough. Um, close enough to make for a realistic uh, assumption under these conditions. So this, this is, so this is really what we do when we talk about rigid body dynamics, right? There's no such thing as a truly rigid body, but if we're interested in the overall motion of the body, and if the strains in the body are, are tiny, very small, then the rigid body model, which is an, only an idealization, becomes a very useful and, and predictive idealization to use, right? There's no such thing as a rigid body literally, and there's no such thing as a, an elastic plastic material for which there's literally no elastic strain in general, but under these conditions, it's a useful idealization, just like the rigid body is a useful ideal, idealization, it gives you meaningful predictions. So let's see um, where this leads us. By the way, this assumption uh, covers all of the classical theory prior to say, you know, the, I would say um, the, the uh, prior to say the first quarter of the 20th century, let's say. So all of the classical theory pertains to this idealization. Okay, so if H transpose H is the identity, then because the determinant of H is positive, that means H must be a rotation, right? 
let's call it Q. It could vary from one point to another. It's not a rigid body rotation by any means. It's just a rotation field. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay, so if th this means the elastic strain then, we're idealizing, we're, we're considering it to be effectively zero. The strain energy function then is fixed, right? Because the strain energy evaluated at zero strain is just a number put in. So u at zero, u at equal zero is just a number, a fixed number. So it's evolute, it's dot with respect to time here is gonna be zero. In general, u dot is however, s inner product e dot, where s is symmetric, but e is fixed at the value identity according to this idealization. So e dot is zero. So you put a zero here and you, the whole thing equals zero. That means S is effectively arbitrary. It can be any symmetric tensor. The only restriction associated with S is that the yield function should be satisfied if we're going to talk about yield in the material, in other words, plastic evolution, okay? So, um, so again, this situation is quite similar to rigid body dynamics. A rigid body contains stress it's just that we don't have enough equations to determine it. Right? In a rigid body, you have a non-zero stress field, but it cannot be determined at the level of constitutive equations. Right? There's not enough information. The stress state in a rigid body, if you've taken ME185, for example, you know that this, the stress in a rigid body is really a tensor of Lagrange multipliers associated these six constraints, F transpose F is the identity, that's six scalar constraints because this is a symmetric matrix. Those six constraints together give rise to six Lagrange multipliers, which are the six components of the stress. But we have no further information about them except that those stresses give rise to resultant forces and moments which enter into the equations of rigid body dynamics. Okay, but we cannot determine the stress state in a rigid body. Even though we can determine the motion in a rigid body, we can't determine the stress state. The situation is similar here, except we do have a restriction on the stress in this case, namely the stress should satisfy the yield function the criterion. So for, for all these reasons, this, the model we're talking about at the moment is called the rigid plastic model, or to be more precise, an elastically rigid plastic model. It's elastically rigid, H is a rotation. Okay, so let's have a look at the relationship between the Cauchy stress and our S tensor that S is unrestricted. That's a tensor, not a scalar, sorry. Um, that enters the yield function, so we should characterize it somehow. The general expression is this, that H T equals H S H transpose. If H is going to be approximated by a rotation Q, then we have this on the right and its determinant will be one. So T is Q S Q transpose, where Q now is the elastic factor in the deformation gradient, right? It's not uniform like in a rigid body, but it, it's a rotation field. Solve this for S, we get Q transpose TQ. We're interested in dev S because we need that in the yield function. That's Q transpose, the, so this, the, the dev of this, the deviatory part of this, which is this minus one third its trace times the identity. Now, the nice thing about the trace is that it's unaffected by the Q with Q as a rotation or any orthogonal tensor as it is here because this is the same as the trace of Q, Q transpose times T, which is the same as the trace of T. And then I can write the identity as Q transpose Q because Q is a rotation. And then I have Q transpose times the square bracket Q, but the square bracket itself is just the deviatoric Cauchy stress. And I'll call it tau so I can, I don't have to carry around this notation all the time. That's Q transpose tau deviatoric Cauchy stress times Q. Okay. So our yield function now, we indicated we want it to be a function of deviatoric S. Deviatoric S is 
Q transpose deviatoric Cauchy times Q. But recall that this F tilde is an isotropic function. So it, this is the same as F at tau, F tilde at tau, right? Simply be, by virtue of isotropy. Q at this stage is any rotation. We don't, we don't know which rotation, but whatever rotation it is, the isotropy restriction tells us that we can replace this by this. Right? So that means you can take your von Mises function as a function of deviatoric S and simply replace deviatoric S by deviatoric part of the Cauchy stress. And if you look in the classical literature, that's the form in which von Mises originally expressed the yield function. He didn't know anything about the modern theory of plasticity that we've been talking about or this S tensor we've been talking about. He just wrote down this yield function, deviatoric Cauchy stress. But now we have a framework in which we can understand how we get to that classical formulation of von Mises yield function. It emerges from isotropy and also from the neglect of elastic strain. Okay. Okay, let's look at the flow rule. That was g dot g inverse is lambda deviatoric s. Deviatoric s is q transpose tau deviatoric t times q. So that's the yield function. Again, this is restricted to the case of negligible elastic strain. Pre multiply by Q, post multiply by Q transpose, and you can rewrite that this way. Okay. Okay, so this looks kind of mysterious. Uh, how can we interpret this? Well, let's go back to basic continuum mechanics and recall that we can write the spatial velocity gradient. We usually call that L. That's the gradient of V with respect to position in the current configuration, small g gradient. That's F dot F inverse, right? If you remember your basic continuum mechanics. We can split that into the sum of symmetric and skew parts. That's a unique additive decomposition. In other words, for any L, there's a unique symmetric part and a unique skew part. So D here is the symmetric part of L W is the skew part. And physically, in continuum mechanics, we know that B is associated with the straining of the tensor as, a, as an evolving process. You have an evolution in time here. B accounts for the straining and the stretching of the material. And W, we call that the vorticity tensor. That's like a rotation of the material locally. Okay, spin, spin of the material. Okay. In fact, the axial vector of this skew tensor is nothing other than the vorticity in fluid dynamics. Okay. Um, well, we have a formula for F. F is H times G, right? Because H is FK, which means F is HK inverse, which is HG. So we can put that on the left-hand side here and then figure out what D and W are. Okay. F is HG, H is Q rotation. Let's compute F dot right here in the parenthesis, F inverse right here. The G's disappear from this first term and it just gives you Q dot Q transpose, which I'm sure you all know is a skew tensor. Just differentiate Q, Q transpose as the identity with respect to time. And you'll see that this is equal to the negative of its transpose and therefore is skew. Then we get Q, G dot G inverse Q transpose, but that from the flow rule, this recap, this rewritten flow rule is just lambda tau. Tau is the deviatoric Cauchy stress. So this is symmetric. This is skew and this is symmetric, but there's only one way to split L into the sum of symmetric and skew tensors. So the Q dot Q transpose must be this W and the rest must be this D. So by the uniqueness of the symmetric and skew decomposition of L, we, we find that the vorticity tensor is Q dot Q transpose, whereas D, 
is lambda tau, lambda non-negative. And this is the classical theory, okay? This, this form of the theory, so the, the second equation here, nobody was much concerned about the skew part here, but the second equation here goes all the way back to St. Venon, 1870. And about the same time, someone named Levy, uh, a fellow countryman of St. Venon, was working in the same area. He generalized St. Venon's work to three dimensions in 1871. So this is called the Levy-St. Venon theory. And that's in modern notation, it's just this equation. They, and they proposed this equation on the basis of experiments, experimental observation, in really what was one of the most ingenious um, interpretations of experiments ever in the history of mechanics. Instead of proposing that the strain was proportional to the deviatoric Cauchy stress, Cauchy stress St. Bernard had the remarkable insight that it was the, you think of D as a kind of an increment of strain, approximately. It was the increment of strain, or actually D, that's proportional to the deviatoric Cauchy stress. Later, von Mises wrote down the same equation about 1913. So this is ancient history by our standards. This is about where the subject of plasticity had its start in terms of uh, a theory of responsive metals, okay? And what's remarkable here is that we've derived this under clear hypotheses in the framework of modern continuum mechanics, the hypotheses being isotropy and neglect of the elastic strain, okay? So the, these people, St. Bernard and Levy, they did not have these tools that we have at our disposal. They didn't have modern continuum mechanics and they were not really aware of the idea of, of a material symmetry group in the, in the manner that we've been exploiting it. So it's kind of remarkable that we were able to derive the classical theory in the framework of this, of the so-called modern theory. So this, here's a little, a little uh, editorial comment here, if you like. The derivation of this classical model in the framework of the modern theory, based on the decomposition of the deformation gradients into elastic and plastic parts, combined with the notion of material symmetry, which is much, much more recent vintage, the modern theory of material symmetry wasn't really laid down until the 1950s. Knowles, Knowles rule and everything we've been talking about, that goes back to Knowles 1958 paper. Um, although the idea of crystal symmetry was known for long before that, but the, sort of the, the, the mathematical notion of material symmetry and how to use it was not known at the time of St. Bernard. So nevertheless, we were able to derive his, this classical theory uh, in the modern framework and that, I think, from my, to my thinking, uh, promotes confidence not only in the classical theory, but also in the modern framework, because the classical theory was inspired by experiments, whereas the modern theory is rooted in developments in modern continuum mechanics that, that took place, uh, say, in the years, in the 50s and the years following, 1950s. So, this sort of ties the whole story together and also puts the classical theory on a firm foundation from the standpoint of modern continuum mechanics. The reason I harp on this is because prior to the advent of the modern theory, which really didn't start taking off until the mid fifties uh, and later with notions about differential geometry and so on that we've been talking about. Prior to the modern theory, there was really no way to connect this equation, three, this classical equation, to any notion of isotropy. Because there's no configuration. This is all, this is, these variables are defined entirely in the current configuration. D and the Cauchy stress, deviatoric Cauchy stress. There's no reference or intermediate state relative to which we could define a notion of material symmetry. And so in particular, there's no way to relate this con constitutive equation to the idea of isotropy per se. Okay. So we, however, we were able to derive this as a special case of the isotropic theory. 
So that's kind of impressive, actually. So here I'm making a note, prior to the modern theory, there was no real way to connect that equation to the concept of material symmetry and hence isotropy, apart from noting that that constitutive equation does define what's called an isotropic function, although that notion pertains to frame invariance or invariance under superposed rigid motions, not to material symmetry. Frame inv invariance has nothing to do with material symmetry. Okay, so this led to a lot of confusion. So much so, I'll stop here, but so much so that the people who were sort of creating modern continuum mechanics from the 1950s onward would have nothing to do with plasticity because an equation like this made little sense as a constitutive equation from the vantage point of concepts like material symmetry, which were being formulated in modern continuum mechanics. So that led to a kind of remarkable omission. If you look at major treatises in modern continuum mechanics, like Truesdell and Knoll, for example, they won't say a word about plasticity. And that be, that's because the, the, the uh, workers in the modern theory could not fit classical plasticity theory into the modern framework. So I'm overstating the point here, but so it's, you know, we, we're able here to, part of, part of the motivation for this course is just to do that, to, to fit old ideas about plasticity into the modern continuum mechanical framework so that they can be better understood and also generalized in a systematic way. Okay, next time I'll talk about this notion of frame invariance, this as distinct from material symmetry. And I think it's a good, time, a good place to stop here. We'll also continue on to discuss uh, solutions to this that can be had in the framework of this classical theory. The main reason for studying the classical theory is that there's an enormous body of worked out solutions of practical importance that people have discovered over the years. And we'll talk about some of that uh, moving forward here. Okay, are there any questions? Um, actually, I have a question. Yeah. And um, on page sixteen. Sixteen. Uh, sixteen. Yeah. Okay. I don't. I don't have that at the moment. But. Um. Page, page sixteen on the PDF. Out of the twenty. Like. Uh, With these pages. Yeah. Yeah. So what? Do you have a page number? Page number. If you go to the PDF, it's sixteen out of the twenty. This PDF? Yeah. What? It starts at page 92, 92 plus 16. That's what, 108? Yeah. Okay. Um, Here we are. Yeah. In this page, I think we proved the incompressibility during plastic deformation. However, for this, it was imperative to make the assumption that the material is isotropic. Does this allude to that? If you do not have an isotropic material, then you do not have incompressibility. No, no not at all. The, uh, you can have, uh, most flow rules, even for an, an isotropy are constructed for metals to yield uh, JG equals constant. Okay. So there's absolutely no restriction to isotropy. It just so happens that this flow rule satisfies plastic incompressibility. Yeah. Okay. But it's, so, a sufficient condition for plastic incompressibility is von Mises' flow rule. By no yeah. means is that a necessary condition. Far from it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any, any other questions? Okay. If not, then have a good weekend, everybody, and I'll see you uh, on the other side of the weekend. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.